So welcome. Um, Ms. Liz Dillon is on the Facebook Live app right now, and she can answer any questions that you may have um, this evening um, via the chat. She'll send those over to myself and Dr. Lynn Ogawa. So if you're joining us live on Facebook, please put your comments and questions in the chat um, on that end. And we are recording this um, community conversation for documentation purposes. Um, we cannot get into specifics about client cases or discuss private or confidential information about residents we serve on this call. So just reminders there. Um, again, our community conversation agreements um, during this time are to keep your phone and device on mute if you are not speaking. Um, listen actively, respect others when they are talking, speak from your own experience instead of generalizing. Do not be afraid to respectfully challenge one another by asking questions, but please refrain from any personal attacks. Really focus on the ideas this evening and participate to the fullest of your ability. Um, community growth depends on the inclusion of every individual voice here. And the goal here is not to agree, it's to gain a deeper understanding, like I mentioned earlier, around COVID-19 vaccines and testing, and step up and step back. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the purpose of this community conversation this evening with Dr. Lynn Ogawa is to learn more about COVID-19 vaccines and testing, and to ask questions and share your concerns or comments to Dr. Ogawa. All right, so just a brief intro of Dr. Lynn Ogawa. Dr. Ogawa is a family physician who graduated from the University of Missouri, Columbia Medical School, and came to Minnesota for a residency in family and community medicine. She did an additional fellowship in community medicine. She has spent more than 25 years in primary care at federally qualified community health centers throughout the Twin Cities. She transitioned to public health two years ago because of her increasing focus on racial health disparities and political determinants of health. Welcome, Dr. Ogawa. It's great to have you back in this space. Welcome community. It looks like we have 21 participants so far on the call. Just a reminder to keep your phones on mute. You can certainly put any questions or comments in the chat as Dr. Ogawa jumps into her presentation. So Dr. Ogawa, I'm gonna get your slides back up. Um, so give Sounds me good. one second, but That's welcome okay. back here. It's good to be back. I enjoy um, coming and speaking to folks and answering as many questions as I can. Um, I was just going to present a little bit of information through some slides initially, um, but think of these slides as um, a, potentially a jumping off um, point for, um, for, a, for more of the conversation. So thanks for the introduction. Um, so what um, I was going to talk briefly about the COVID-19 uh, vaccines. So currently in the U.S., there is one vaccine fully approved by the FDA for use in the U.S., and that is the Pfizer um, product for 16. Um, excuse me, I'm 19, older. but I got the Pfizer. Is that a problem? No, it's approved for 16 and older. There's also um, other vaccines approved under what's called emergency use authorization in the US. And that is the same Pfizer vaccine for the ages 12 to 15, Moderna for ages 18 and older, and Johnson and Johnson for ages 18 and older. Next slide, please. The phase three studies that resulted in um, allowing the vaccines to go forward under the emergency use authorization were done um, June of last year, or June of last year. For Moderna, there were over 30,000 volunteers. There were ultimately 196 symptomatic confirmed cases of COVID, 185 in the placebo group or the people who didn't get the vaccine and 11 in the vaccinated. And so in the Pfizer study, there were um, 43,538 volunteers, um, 170 cases of COVID reported in the time frame, 162 cases in the placebo group and eight in the vaccinated group. This was where the initial effective um, calculations were done. Um, these studies took place um, in the U.S., some sites in the U.S., but many throughout the world as well. Um, next slide. 
I mentioned that Pfizer has full FDA support, and the reason it has full FDA support is they also um, gave uh, the FDA additional data of 46,308 volunteers who had um, uh, post the initial study. And there were 927 cases of COVID, 850 of those occurred in the placebo, and 77 occurred in the vaccine vaccinated, um, which showed about 91.3% effectivity. Now, what's interesting or what's important too is that 32 cases of severe disease and they were all in the placebo. So this is why Pfizer received full FDA um, use um, and approval, unlike um, the Moderna and um, Pfizer for um, 11, or excuse me, 12 to 15 is still under the emergency use authorization. So this was the phase three results that supported full authorization for Pfizer um, over the age of 18. Next slide, please. So as part of that same study, there were um, Pfizer distributed um, uh, vaccine to 12 to 16 year olds. So um, there were about 2,229 volunteers um, that were between the ages of 12 and 16 in the initial study. There were 18 documented cases of COVID and all of those occurred in the placebo. Um, so they can state 100% effect, being 100% effective in preventing disease in 12 to 16 year olds. We know that no vaccines though are 100%. But this showed very good and reassuring data for that age group. And so they were given the EUA for 12 to 16 year olds. Next slide. The most recently released information that Pfizer um, produced is actually for those ages five to 11. And this just came out about two days ago now, I believe. There were 2,268 participants. They used for this age group um, a different dose. The, the usual dose of Pfizer is 30 micrograms, 21 days apart. And for the younger children, for five to 11 year olds, they used a dose of 10 micrograms, um, 21 days apart. The endpoint for this study is different than the other studies, though, because we haven't seen enough cases to say, oh, then there were so many cases within this number of participants. So the endpoint that has been used in this study um, uses um, serum from those vaccinated, and it tests against a, neutral, a neutralizing antibody test. So the, the endpoint, what we call the endpoint, is a little bit different here. But this correlates with um, uh, the protection a person would see in the real world. I talk about this too, because it highlights one of the confounding issues that we see when people talk about IgM and IgG immunity as being a way to test if somebody is fully protected against COVID. Those IgM and IgG are important antibody levels, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can truly um, neutralize or kill the COVID virus. So there's a specific um, neutralizing test that was created to make sure that an individual after getting a vaccine or, or actually after getting COVID itself um, would be able to neutralize the virus if it saw it again. And so I talk about how, or I, I, some people ask why we can't simply use IgM and IgG levels to see if somebody is protected. And the reason is that that's only one component of, of our immune response. Next slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit now, oh, next slide, about some of the most concerning side effects that have been reported. Um, the first one that I wanted to touch base on was myocarditis. Myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart muscle. Usually the symptoms are chest pain, shortness of breath or fatigue. In general, it actually most often occurs in young men and it follows a viral infection. Previously, there's been no specific virus necessarily, but it's been, um, it, uh, it's been seen after multiple different viruses um, in the regular world. 
myocarditis actually was one of the first identified specific causes of COVID deaths, especially in young individuals as COVID came onto the scene. Um, so what um, a, the study looked at was the increased risk of myocarditis after vaccination compared to no vaccination and no infection. And there was a slight increase in risk for young men um, at 2.7 cases per 100,000 if they received the vaccine. Now, when they looked at the risk of myocarditis, if a young man were to get COVID, that risk was actually significantly higher. And so the, the, the field, or there were 11 cases per 100,000. So when they looked at potentially vaccinating 1 million 16 and 17 year old boys would actually prevent though 56,000 cases and 500 hospitalizations related to COVID. And so the feeling is that it, while it does increase the risk and we should be aware of it, the risk of, getting, the risk of having myocarditis and other negative side effects like hospitalization and death related to COVID is greater than the increased risk of the myocarditis. Next slide, please. Um, the other uh, main side effect and, and worrisome one that was reported was what's called a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis connected to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This is um, what happens is low platelets, which cause um, both increased clotting and potentially bleeding within the brain. There were three reports of death in the U.S. related to this because the usual treatment for this is to use heparin. But in this case, heparin actually made it worse. Um, so ce cerebral venous thrombosis tends to be in younger women. Um, the reason that the heparin made it, or the reason they feel that this occurred related to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is that their bodies formed an antibody that combined with a specific platelet factor, and it's platelet factor four, causing the thrombosis to occur. I mentioned that normally you give heparin to um, treat this, but what's interesting or not interesting and, and kind of and sad is that heparin also does the same thing and attacks the same spot. And so what they learned was that women who presented with this um, clotting disorder, if they were treated with heparin, then it was made worse. And that's when the three deaths occurred. What we know now is that there is a test if a woman presents, or anyone, not just a woman, presents to an emergency room with a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, we can actually very relatively quickly test for that antibody. And then in that case, the doctors know not to use heparin and use other ways to clear the clot. And since then, there haven't been reported deaths. Um, I will mention that there was also a larger group of women and a larger group of cases actually in the United Kingdom because they used the Astra, they primarily saw it with the AstraZeneca um, vaccine, which is not used in the U.S., but in um, the UK, there were 220 cases um, and 49 deaths before this realization was made. They do believe that it's only, well, and it's only been demonstrated in those vaccines that are viral vector vaccines, not in the messenger RNA vaccines. Boy, I talked a lot on that slide. I'm going to go to the next slide, please. <laughs> um, Another um, reported um, side effect related to Johnson & Johnson was um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. And actually it's a progressive generalized weakness so, and, and paralysis of, uh, of a person. Um, it has also been described previously with other viral vector vaccines. There's been um, about, uh, about 100 cases reported in the US through um, the vaccine adverse event uh, record system. 95 did require hospitalization and one death. Um, it's more common in men over the age of 50, although not exclusively, but um, Guillain-Barre is, is one of those uh, syndromes that also was linked to flu vaccines um, in the past. And now we have seen some reports uh, linked to Johnson & Johnson as well. Next slide. 
Um, I'm just going to shift a little bit and highlight some of the vaccine clinics that um, the county um, is uh, involved with, um, as well as also um, many primary healthcare providers, local pharmacies are all, um, uh, are many are offering the vaccines directly. Here from the county, we do, uh, we've been doing a number of pop-up clinics um, throughout the pandemic, or since vaccine has been available um, in schools, community centered, churches, mosques, trying to um, make available and easy access to vaccines. Um, and then the website there for um, uh, checking out that. Next slide. I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit and talk briefly about testing for COVID-19. There's been um, a lot of talk uh, about different kinds of tests. And usually people wanna say, oh, the nose test or the throat test or the spit test. Those aren't actually the best way to describe tests. So I, I, I broke down the, the two ways that, that, that we look at tests. Um, the first way is what's called a rapid antigen test, and it actually usually uses um, a nasal swab, not the deep nasal swab, not the one that everybody was really hesitant to use before, um, but usually a, 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 a small one. It tests for part of the virus. It gives the best results when the virus is active and replicating. So this test was primarily used initially for people who were symptomatic or um, uh, have it or had and had been having symptoms for a few days. Um, when I say that it's best when the virus is active is because we know when, when it's positive, we can trust that that's a full positive. We can trust more that that's a true positive. Problems occur when we get a negative test because if somebody is not symptomatic or if the virus is at low levels, then it's a then it could be a potentially a false negative. So this has good um, times for testing, but often we talk about um, using the PCR or the NAT test, which is the, the other one that I talk about here, um, which is a little bit more um, sensitive. So with PCR testing and NAT testing, um, a negative test is almost often, is most often a true negative, but a positive can potentially have amplified dead or, or a non-transmissible virus. So a positive can sometimes be um, because somebody was infected previously and is recovering now, or um, that um, they've cleared the virus but may have still a little bit left in their system. Um, it's usually performed in the lab. This one can be done on saliva, a nasal swab, or a throat swab. These are the ones that usually take 24 to 72 hours for a result. However, now there's a new form that is a, what we call a rapid point of care testing. It's usually a nasal or a throat swab. There's a, a mechanism that amplifies the data, the DNA or um, the part of the virus right away. And the process can take three to 50, uh, um, as little as three minutes and at most 15 to 20. So this is a way that is, can give us rapid results and is also quite sensitive and quite specific. Next slide. Oh, actually, I'm gonna go back one more. Sorry. One of the things that um, I wanted to, to talk about with this slide as well is that we, we really recommend that anyone who isn't or can't be vaccinated be tested regularly. The reason is that that's our best way to know if someone is infected. Um, also, based on the rate that um, Delta, the Delta variant um, replicates and spreads, our current recommendation is that people be tested once a week. Um, or, and if they're, especially if they're around other people, like school children, like unvaccinated family members, things like that. If a person is vaccinated though, and they have a close contact with someone who ends up being positive, they should also be tested because we do know that while the vaccine is very good at preventing individuals from being hospitalized, from being sick or, and, and, and dying, we do know now that there are some people who will get infected and potentially pass that um, infection on even if they've been vaccinated. So the recommendation for someone who's been vaccinated but is around somebody else who is positive that is that they get tested at about day five 
after being exposed, but that they also monitor for symptoms um, for up to 14 days after they were around that person and be tested again if they get symptoms anytime in the future. Next slide. Um, sorry, one of my kids just got home from school. Nothing like um, the um, real life. Hold on just a moment. Okay. All right. <laughs> Got it taken care of. Um, <laughs> anyway, these are some testing locations, very important um, for people to recognize, um, especially families um, of school children or individuals who aren't um, vaccinated. Um, um, because like I mentioned, it's uh, except part of mitigation is also knowing um, if people are positive um, and, and making sure that then you're, you're isolating. I realize I did a lot of talking um, and um, I usually like to uh, answer questions more than just lecturing. So I think we'll stop there for right now and, and move on. Thank you, Dr. Ogawa. Thank you everyone <laughs> for joining us. I think we're on a better path now. Um, I have muted everyone except for myself and Dr. Ogawa. I'm gonna release that function so that people can speak. Um, I see a few questions in the chat, Dr. Ogawa. And so what I would ask everyone is continue to put your questions in the chat. If you're live on Facebook, Liz Dillon will send those questions over to us here on our Zoom call. And then also you can raise your hand. And so you, we do want to have a dialogue. Like Dr. Ogawa said, if you've attended these community conversations in the past, we look forward to having these conversations. Um, and so we are navigating this virtual space as best as we can. And so um, let's go to the chat, Dr. Ogawa. Looks like we have our first question from Dr. Jean Lee. Um, so some fully vaccinated people have gotten COVID anyway. Will there be an answer on vaccination and medication to totally prevent a person from getting it? That may be the time when you don't need to wear a mask and can do things more normally like before COVID hit. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, um, I agree. I wish that we could um, say that the vaccination not only prevents people from getting um, sick with COVID, but also prevents um, any spread of the disease. Unfortunately, we really do know that that not that we don't have any vaccine that's 100%. Um, and so right now, currently, our, our best um, other mitigation is to continue to wear masks um, when we're around um, and close uh, in proximity to others. Um, we, we are still working, um, the, or at least the medical community is still working on the use of um, antibody infusions um, and um, for individuals early in the disease. And we do believe that it reduces the risk of people um, uh, getting sick with uh, the infection or other things. And I do know that there are also um, studies ongoing for other treatments that may also help reduce um, transmission, but um, it is difficult. Yeah. Good question, Jean. So I'm going to read the questions, Dr. Ogawa, because we do have folks on Facebook um, live in here um, that may not be able to see the chat. So does um, recovering from COVID provide similar protection as the vaccine? So it, this is this is a, uh, a debated um, area, and and I uh, so I'll I'll comment on what what I the the information that I've seen and the information that I talk with patients about. Um, we we do know that for at least the first three months after what I'm going to call a natural COVID infection, people have um, good um, protection against being reinfected in that three month period of time. We weren't sure how long that natural immunity would last, and um, it's difficult to, to know for sure. There was recently a study done, actually, I'm going to say it wrong. I want to say Kentucky, but it may have been Tennessee. <laughs> That's terrible, but I think it was Kentucky, where they actually looked at individuals who ended up getting COVID two times. So they actually scanned their database of uh, positives and they compared people and they looked at individuals who had gotten COVID twice. And they looked at, and then they looked at those individuals as to whether or not they had gotten vaccinated or whether they had not gotten vaccinated. And when they compared those two um, groups, they showed that unvaccinated individuals who had had 
an episode of COVID, were about 2.7 times more likely to get COVID again than those who had received a vaccine. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is not a perfect study because it's, it was what we call a retrospective study, which means we looked at what happened in the past and we are guessing at whether or not that, that, that the only cause of, or the only thing that made that difference was the vaccine. And we know that is, they didn't look at other potential risks that the, the people had, but at least it gives us an idea that vaccinating still does offer increased protection than just individuals who have had COVID naturally. Thank you, Dr. Ogawa. Let me try to get back to the chat. I'm having a little bit of technology. Go I was ahead. gonna I was gonna mention before you got to the chat, um, we had actually had a, a question come in earlier um, specifically about the state fair. Um, and um, so I was just gonna mention there there was a there was over a million people who attended the state fair. There were no masks required. There was no way for us to really tell though how many folks ended up wearing masks versus not wearing masks. So when we look at the number of cases that came out of the state fair, right now the state is reporting that about 228 cases were connected directly to the state fair. In the grand scheme of things, that's a really good low number. And so the state is comfortable saying that right now, as of today, the state fair was not what we were worried about, which was what we would call a super spreader event, um, which is good. We just don't know, again, what, what of the mitigation that we provided at the state fair made the biggest difference. And in my opinion, as a public health person, any mitigation efforts that were followed, so for all of the people who did wear masks, for all of the people who washed their hands, for all of the people who stayed not in crowded sections very long or things like that, I think, and the fact that uh, the state and we as Ramsey County were actually there providing information and vaccines, I think all of those levels of mitigation helped prevent um, a super spreader event, and I'm glad. Um, just personally, I'm also glad because I love the state fair and I did need a corn dog or two, and I I, you know, think that that was important too. So. We all love the state fair, I think. So thank you for providing that information. Dr. Ogao, can you open the chat for me and read some of the questions that have come in? I don't want to mute myself because my computer's trying to catch up right now. You bet. And so I'm not sure what the glitch, not sure what the glitch is, but I want to make sure that we're getting to the questions in the chat. And so Let's go see. ahead and put your questions in the chat if you do have them this evening. For vaccinated individuals, one of the questions from Mary is, for vaccinated individuals who are exposed and tested for COVID, do they still isolate even if no symptoms are present? So I'm going to guess that that means the test is negative or you're waiting for the test. If the test is negative and you're waiting for the test, you don't, and you're vaccinated, you don't necessarily have to isolate completely. We still recommend though, that if you've been exposed, that you wear a mask when you're out and about um, or in areas with other, because there is still that, like I mentioned, even for vaccinated individuals, that um, you could potentially have replicating virus in um, uh, your uh, nose or mouth and spread the infection. Um, if the test is positive, then you would need to to, to isolate at that point. Because whenever anybody is positive, we have the risk, regardless of vaccination status, we have the risk for spreading the infection. And so that's when we would stay um, isolated and, and away from others completely. Okay. Um, the next question is from um, Heidi Walls. And that is, is there any plan to have testing sites in our schools or school districts? Not everyone has transportation to the community sites. So um, actually, that's a, uh, it's an excellent question. And um, the, um, the state of Minnesota um, has, um, well, I'm going to back up. In Ramsey County, we um, do support um, the school districts to the best of our ability and uh, with technical assistance and with talking about options. The state of Minnesota also opened up um, some opportunities for um, testing, um, within the school districts, um, trying to figure out, and it depends on the district, um, what, type of, what type of test and systems uh, work for them. Um, there isn't a statewide, you must, you, can, you, you must use this test in this way for the school districts right now. Um, it's 
part of the difficulty in deciding a one fit one size fits all for 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 lots of options. I know that the state though is recognizing that they need more testing sites. Um, and so that's why some of the um, uh, previous sites are reopening like um, Roy Wilkins, like um, Bloomington sites. I do expect that we will be seeing more and more on-site testing options um, it coming uh, up as well. We just don't have a, a full answer yet. Sarah has gone. Nope. So, Dr. Ogawa, I'm still here. Can you still see me? <laughs> yep, yep. No, okay. we couldn't there for a little bit, but now we can. Yep. So, I turned off my camera for a reason. I'm trying to figure Got out it. some things on my end. I'm not sure what's going on with Zoom now. But, Liz, can you let me know if you can still see us on Facebook Live? Let's see. You all can see me. I cannot see you right now. So, I'm just letting you know that. So, Dr. Ogawa, why don't Got you it. continue? People should be able to take themselves off mute. Okay. Um, to ask questions, but if we want to continue with the chat, I just encourage people to ask questions. This is a space to find out all things related to vaccines, to testing, any of the burning questions that you've had for a while. <laughs> we haven't had one of these conversations <laughs> since I think April, right? Um, and so this is your opportunity to talk to Dr. Ogawa um, about um, those questions, comments, or concerns. Right now, actually, I don't see any more questions in the chat, unless there are, and I'm just missing them, but I've scrolled down, and I think I caught the ones that were were written. Maybe we've answered all of them. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> and I, Liz, I can't see the chat, so if there's anything coming in from Facebook Live, we are here to take your questions if you're listening in from your mobile, mobile device or at home. Um, this evening. Um, and just know that if you do have um, future topics for our community conversation with Dr. Lynn Ogawa, you can send those topics and questions to our racial equity. I just, I, Go ahead. I also, I see a new one. Um, and that is um, mm -hmm. from Lori. Um, it's about, would you recommend a booster shot regardless of what the government allows? So this is interesting. Um, uh, I've been trying to, 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 to stay up on as much of the data that we're getting back about boosters. Um, and I, I was, um, I, I like to delineate between a third dose and a booster uh, first. And so what I do, what I like to point out is that people who are um, severely immune compromised, so individuals who have had a, what we call a solid organ transplant or um, individuals who are on um, immune modulating medications um, for like rheumatoid arthritis or things like that. Um, individuals who have severe immune deficiencies, um, individuals who are um, currently being treated for cancer with chemotherapeutic agents and are severely um, uh, immune compromised, individuals who've had a bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant within two years. Those are, those are a very um, well-defined group that did not initially have as good of an immune response to the vaccines as other people did. And so the makers of Pfizer and Moderna are strongly recommending that those individuals get a third dose, not as a booster, but really to try and get their initial reaction to the vaccine up to closer to those of those of people who have a regular immune system. So that's that third dose. Um, and that's really important. And so individuals who are wondering if they uh, would qualify for that third dose, we actually are really recommending that you talk to your uh, regular provider about that um, because it's, it's a very specific population. Now about boosters, um, the, the, <laughs> the, the FDA just re reviewed a, a great deal of the data and they felt um, and looking at the data that um, individuals who have an, a, a normal immune system and who responded well seem to continue to have a good immune response when what we call challenged by a virus um, even after we see some of their antibodies reducing or, or otherwise. It's a little bit hard though, to know for sure when that point is at which the protection stops. 
We know that people over the age of 65, their immune system isn't as strong as it is when you're younger. And we also know from uh, data out of Israel that they started to see um, people over the age of 65 who had been um, vaccinated need to be hospitalized um, uh, when uh, they had another surge. And so we are definitely concerned that individuals who are over the age of 65 may have waning immunity um, around, we think, six to eight months in time. The other data though, so far on people who are immune competent is a little more mixed. We haven't, we've seen some increases in hospitalizations around the world. We um, de haven't seen deaths um, increase in those vaccinated necessarily, but because of the concern about hospitalization, um, there has been some talk about whether or not a booster um, is in order. The other thing that is a little bit concerning is with variants. And so um, what we do know is that the neutralizing antibodies that were formed initially from the vaccine for the first, we'll say first COVID, um, still exist for the Delta variant, but it, they're not quite as strong. So it takes a little bit longer to clear it, so to speak, and it may not be as protective as it was before. So that's one of the reasons why people are thinking and the, the federal government is trying to make a decision about whether or not um, it would be um, a good idea to begin boosters. As a public health person, and so now we're getting into my own opinion, um, it's, it's a little bit hard for me um, to say that boosters are, are absolutely um, necessary now. And I worry a little bit about individuals who haven't even gotten a first dose. You know, we do have a lot of vaccine available in the U.S. now, but I remember back to the beginning of the of the uh, pandemic and when we didn't have vaccine and when we didn't have enough uh, vaccine to go around. And I don't, I worry that we want to make sure that everybody is getting um, those first doses to to protect um, at a, at a higher level than if we if if in fact we don't necessarily need boosters yet. We don't have, the, the science isn't perfect. Um, I'm not clamoring to get my booster at this point because again, I, I'm still focused on getting as many people their first um, doses as possible. So that's a little bit of a, <laughs> I, I, got, I went off on a tangent a bit, I apologize. Um, let's see. There was a question about the Delta variant making, it seems so much more powerful. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to interpret that that means sort of like the fact that the Delta variant is we're seeing so many more cases again, sort of causing a surge and then also causing a surge in hospitalizations. And um, what's interesting about the Delta variant is that it is significantly more infectious than um, the original COVID um, virus that was described. And so um, the way that I describe this is it, it, it makes, it replicates actually faster in its host. So once a person gets the infection, they uh, disseminate <laughs> more virus than the original um, COVID. So they're making more copies of itself. In public health, the way that they describe how infectious something a virus is, is they use the term called R0 or R0. Regular COVID was um, an, what was considered R naught of two. So for every one person who was infected, they would potentially, without any other mitigation, would potentially infect two other people. The Delta variant is actually, uh, an, has an R naught of nine, which means for every one person who is infected, they can potentially spread it to nine individuals. And then those nine individuals can spread it to nine more and, those not, and, and so forth. So the infection spreads so much faster and, um, that, and to more people that it can really cause uh, more disease again. And that's what we're seeing. 
the other thing that's happening is we're seeing definitely that um, hospitals are taking care of not just um, COVID um, patients, but the increase in COVID patients, in addition to all of those patients that they need to be seeing for other things, heart attacks, appendicitis, things like that, are, are also still in the hospitals. And so some of our um, hospital, hospitals are really um, getting taxed again with the number of people who are there, which also makes it harder to treat all of those things. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and read the next question from Thanks, Kathy. Um, it says, we're looking to begin in-person English classes for adults. We're requiring masks, regular hand washing, especially upon arrival to the building. One of our concerns is about social distancing, especially as people are arriving and moving around our building. What level of strictness would you recommend for us as we manage masked adults moving around our buildings? So what I would what I would comment on uh, in regards to this is that as people are masked, that definitely reduces the risk of transmission because it traps. The idea is it traps um, as much of the um, the particles as um, as you can. When people are moving swiftly through areas or just coming and going and not staying in one area and um, talking a lot or um, sort of in, in <laughs> spreading potential virus into the air, the risk is remains a little bit lower. The other thing that I would recommend is that um, we want to talk in areas about bringing in as much fresh air as possible. And so I know that a lot of buildings have also worked on increasing their airflow their uh, filtration and also bringing in fresh air. And that makes a big difference as people are moving around as well. So if you're in a building or if you're in a room where windows can be opened a little bit, we're cooling off, but we're not snowing yet in Minnesota, that allows fresh air to mix with um, the air within a room or a building, that's often much, that's also very helpful. And so, um, that's one of the, the recommendations that I would make in terms of um, as, as people come back and begin together. The other thing is the total number of individuals, the, the fewer people that are, I'll use uh, Dr. Osterholm's phrase, swapping air, the better still. Um, and so being, being aware of how many people are in that space and sharing that space. Thank you, Dr. Ogawa. Again, as I answer questions, I was just going to say, as I answer questions, if I stray too much or the person who asked the question <laughs> says, wait a minute, you didn't really answer my question, please interrupt me. <laughs> yes, please let us know. And again, continue to use the chat function. I think folks are able to come off mute um, if they do want to um, raise their hand and, and make a, um, a comment or question. Um, our Deputy County Manager of Health and Wellness Service team just joined us, Ms. Kathy Hadeen. And so I know Dr. Ogawa and Kathy um, can see you. I cannot see you right now. You will probably see me and hear me hopefully still, um, but just want you to know that you do have support there, Dr. Ogawa, um, in the event that more questions come in. Sounds good. And I don't think we have any messages coming out of Facebook book yet either okay that means you've co covered it all right <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> so, um, something along those lines perhaps <laughs> and dr ogawa can you just reiterate while we have some time you know the key mitigation strategies um yeah. to help reduce and slow the spread of covid i think that's something that we continue to cover in public health and stressing various community settings um, any opportunity we have to talk through that um but can you just um talk a little bit about what those mitigation, continued mitigation strategies are. Yeah, um, so, um, you know, part of the reason we were having this conversation today is about vaccine. Um, vaccine definitely um, helps protect individuals personally from hospitalization and death associated with COVID. We also know that while it doesn't prevent um, uh, transmittance a hundred percent, it dramatically reduces transmission and so, and, and helps protect others as well. Um, it, so vaccine is important um, and part of mitigation. Um, also um, mask wearing 
is important um, because it does reduce the amount of um, potential virus being put into the air um, and being shared by others. Distance, social distancing is also important because we know that um, the closer an individual is to you um, and sharing that air, the possibility that they could transmit the virus. Washing your hands um, is still important, especially um, in situations where you may have been, you know, eating, um, where your hands may have come into contact with your, your face, your nose or your mouth um, are also all still important. The last one that we don't always think about, but I, I mentioned is super important and that is testing. Um, because oftentimes we don't know there is an infection unless we test. Um, we've talked previously about how kids um, can have mild symptoms. They can have severe, sim severe symptoms as well, but they might have mild symptoms. In Minnesota, you may have a itchy throat and a, and a um, runny nose, and you might think, oh, it's just allergy season. Um, and the only way that we know if it's COVID and mild is to be tested. And once we know that someone is positive, then that isolation um, period is ex ex exceptionally important as well and part of mitigation. So testing is um, definitely as important as um, all the other mitigation efforts we have as well. Yeah. Sure, and I, I can't remember if this question was in the chat or if we have questions in the chat right now, Dr. Gao, please move to those. But if we do not, um, I'm wondering, another question that we're um, commonly getting, and I think he might've addressed this earlier is, you know, when are vaccines going to become available for our five to 11 year olds? Um, and any information you may have on that? Yeah, I should have mentioned that as I talked about the data that I just pre that I presented earlier, we are hoping because the data um, was just presented to um, the FDA and the CDC that maybe by Halloween, people keep saying that as the <laughs> magic time, <laughs> but I, I like to believe that. Uh, we may actually have uh, the emergency use authorization for uh, children between the ages of five and 11. That would only be for Pfizer at this point. It wouldn't be any of the other eight um, uh, vaccines. We're also hoping that the Moderna data um, on uh, 12, and, uh, 12 to 15 is going to be reviewed around the same time. So that would bring Moderna's approval down in age. Um, uh, but we're hoping that that might happen before the end of the year as well, although it's it's really difficult. This is where it's tough because um, the CDC and the FDA really have to review uh, a, a lot more data, um, but we're hoping for that. Yeah. Sure. Any other questions in the chat? Any questions from folks here directly on the call? There is a question in the chat, um, and um, it's a it's a it's a really interesting question. Um, the question is, um, if you can smell someone's perfume or cigarette through your mask, does it mean it's not providing enough protection? That is a fantastic question, and I wish I had the exact answer. Um, <laughs> what we know is that um, so it, it I I can't speak to truly what the particle size of the scents associated with um, perfumes or cigarettes are. So it's a little bit hard for me. We know that what the N95s prevent are particles as small as, um, uh, uh, oh, oh shoot, like for a second, five micrograms. So they're very small particles. Other masks don't prevent those tiny particles. What's interesting with COVID is we actually don't know exactly the size of particle that it will require to create a full infection in a person, okay? So um, we don't know what the, the load would need to be. So I can't say for sure that if you can smell someone's perfume or cigarette or through the mask that it's not doing its job. It's still doing its job. Um, if you are allowing the airflow behind the mask, we definitely worry about that sometimes because if there's whole sections of air that can be flowing within the mask, then it's probably not actually um, filtering the, um, the, the air quite as well as you would like it to. 
I, I can't help but say that if, if you can smell someone's cigarette through your mask, you shouldn't be around the person smoking a cigarette, but that's easier to say than, <laughs> than not. Um, but um, there have been also some really good um, studies that looked at like, if one person is wearing a mask in a room of people, that individual is protected. And the better the mask, the more protected that person is. So an N95 would be more protective than a standard mask. But they also looked at some studies where they put everybody in the room with um, just a cloth mask or a standard um, simple paper mask. And the fact that everybody was masked dramatically reduced everybody's risk because it both protected the virus from leaving the people as well as protected people from inhaling the virus or other things. So, um, so that's the other reason why as Ramsey, Ramsey County Public Health, we really are recommending that um, it's not just about you wearing a mask to protect yourself, but it's about collectively protecting everyone. And, and collectively we increase um, the protection for everyone too. All right, any other questions that you see in the chat, Dr. Ogawa or any hands one, raised? One just popped up. Um, how long will it take for the vaccines to be as commonly required at certain ages, like the polio vaccine and rubella vaccine? That's a really hard question for me to answer. Um, I hesitate to make um, a guess on that um, because um, vaccine requirements, as we all know, are, are, are part of medicine, but they're also part of uh, societal change and functions um, as a public health person. Um, I do feel very confident that um, the COVID vaccine is doing an amazing job uh, reducing hospitalizations and deaths associated with uh, COVID. We, get, we see in our data that we've, what we've called flattened the curve of hospitalization and death, which is really great. We've even flattened and we've significantly flattened the curve of infections overall. So, um, I do believe that the that the newer COVID vaccines are very are doing what we want them to do medically. Um, I hope that individuals um, listen to the science, listen to their their regular doctors, listen to their trusted um, uh, you know community members, and and believe that the the goal is to prevent people from getting sick with COVID and dying from COVID and, and being in the hospital and ultimately to get it under control, just like we've been able to control polio better, control measles, mumps, and things like that. So I, I hope it, 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 it won't take too long. Um, you know, I, I, I hate to mention it, but we passed the 8,000 mark this, yesterday or today on the number of deaths um, related to COVID in Minnesota. And and, and now going forward, I really do feel like a lot of people have said, um, uh, have mentioned that those deaths are, are truly preventable deaths now. And, and it's hard to, to keep seeing that number rising, not at the rate it was before, but it's just hard to see each of those deaths um, be, because I, I, do, I do trust that, that, that we, could, we can prevent those deaths with, with vaccination, with mitigation and, and other ones. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ogawa. These conversations are so important. We hope to continue the conversations with Dr. Ogawa. Just know that St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health um, will continue to sustain our COVID-19 response. And it's so important, um, a point that you lifted up earlier, Dr. Ogawa, about the importance of community, having trusted community members um, that are providing accurate information in real time. There's, there's a lot of information that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And public health sometimes learns that information along side um, community. And so um, I just want to thank you for being our Ramsey County Medical Director. Um, I want to thank the community that's joined us this evening to continue these conversations, such great questions and comments. Um, if you do have topics that you want Dr. Ogawa to dive deeper into, that you want St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health to explore, um, feel, feel free to reach out to what we call the Racial Equity and Community Engagement Response Teams, Racial Equity Inbox, and you can reach us at racial equity um, at ramseycounty.us. We'll get those comments or questions over to Dr. Ogawa or our public health staff. Um, I just wanna reiterate a few things that Dr. Ogawa mentioned earlier. There are um, two testing locations that we mentioned 
Roy Wilkins Auditorium here in St. Paul um, has free saliva testing Monday through Thursday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Sunday through 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. You can schedule an appointment or just walk in. And the Minnesota Airport Terminal One also has free um, saliva testing available. And there's free parking too, I wanna stress that. Um, and they're open every day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Same thing, schedule an appointment or walk in. And so just stressing the importance of testing. Um, and then as Dr. Ogawa has mentioned, um, there are a variety of vaccine clinics, both here in Ramsey County and statewide. And so I know that some folks that are here on the call may not live directly in Ramsey County, and that's totally fine. But we want you all to know that there's an online locator map through the state of Minnesota where you can find out where there are vaccine sites. So um, consider that, you know, share this information with your neighbors, friends, family members. Um, and um, the website for that for Ramsey County is ramseycounty.us backslash COVID vaccine. All right, well, we're at 5 p.m. I want to thank you all on behalf of Ramsey County, St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health, and also the Racial Equity and Community Engagement Response Team. We want to thank you all for joining us this evening, and we look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you, Dr. Ogawa. Thank you. I always enjoy uh, these conversations and look forward to more. For sure, we enjoy having you. All right, well, take care, everyone.